Scientists often learn more from the oddities of nature than from the ordinary. Such is the case with the humble duck-billed platypus, one of the most bizarre animals to have ever inhabited the earth. The platypus occurs in the freshwater streams of eastern Australia and on the island of Tasmania. Due to its odd appearance, the species has captured the imagination and interest of scientists and school children for generations. When the first Australian platypus was shipped to Britain in the final years of the 18th century, early anatomists were stunned. What animal could have a duck-like bill, webbed feet and claws, the tail of a beaver and fur, but no clear mammary glands or nipples? It proved impossible to cleanly categorize. Was it a bird, a mammal, a fish, or was it an elaborate Aussie hoax? Did this peculiarity of nature, known to European scientists only through dead specimens and limited accounts, lay eggs like a bird or reptile, or did it give birth to live young, like mammals? If it laid eggs, it would be an even greater oddity, given its furry, mammal-like appearance. The peculiar mix of bird-like and mammal-like traits of the platypus suggested to 18th and 19th century scientists that the species represented a transitional form. By this they did not mean transitional in an evolutionary sense because it was still over half a century before Darwin put forth his theory of speciation. Instead, they viewed the species as transitional in classification. Observing the reproductive system of the male and female platypus, anatomist Everard Holm wrote in 1802, These characteristics distinguish the species in a very remarkable manner from all other mammals, giving this new tribe a resemblance in some respects to birds, in others to the amphibian, so that it may be considered as an intermediate link between the classes of mammalia. In retrospect, it is easy to see a foundation building for Darwinian thought. In early 1836, during his five-year round-the-world expedition on board the HMS Beagle, Charles Darwin arrived in Sydney, Australia. In typical fashion, he soon found a guide and set out for the Blue Mountains where he met up with a platypus. A companion shot one of the elusive animals, and upon close inspection, Darwin marveled at the peculiarities of its form. He later wrote, I consider it a great feat to be in at the death of so wonderful an animal. In subsequent decades, one of Charles Darwin's self-critiques about his developing big T theory of speciation was that while there existed plenty of variation among some groups of species, indicating their kinship and diversification into endless forms most beautiful, there were others that lacked these shades of variation. Now lacking the evolutionary insights from genetics that we benefit from today, Darwin's quest for shades of variation among living species and fossils reflected his need to discount that species were unique and unchanging, as it was common for scientists of the early 19th century to believe that species had been specially created and that they were immutable, to use Darwin's word. He suspected that the more unique species appeared to be, the less likely skeptics would be to accept his ideas. To Darwin, the lonely platypus was troublesome, because unlike the finches he knew from the Galapagos and barnacles from every coastline, the platypus lacked close kin. Despite the fewness of species, he realized that the bizarre attributes of the platypus provided evidence for the deeper interrelationship of all species, and it helped him formulate his grand theory. Since the mid-19th century, Fossils of extinct platypus species have been discovered that would have put Darwin's concerns at ease. The recent discovery of the fossil remains of an early platypus in Argentina further cements long-established geological and biological knowledge regarding how and where a species evolved. The platypus developed when South America, Australia, and Africa were joined as part of an ancient continent known as Gondwana. In our time, now that evolution is based on genetics 
as much as the outward appearance of species. These old questions can be addressed in exciting new ways, and we are rapidly gaining answers to these old questions. A 2004 report in the journal Nature showed that the platypus retains a bird-like sex chromosome, suggesting an evolutionary link. This finding by the University of Adelaide's Frank Grutzner is significant because it was thought that sex systems between these broad animal groups had evolved independently. The sex chromosomes of bird and mammals are quite different. In humans, as in mammals overall, sex is determined by the male who carries both an X and Y chromosome. Females carry a set of two X chromosomes. In birds and reptiles, this male-female pattern is reversed. The female determines the sex of the offspring. Kretzner showed that within the platypus's remarkable five pairs of sex chromosomes, some resemble those of birds in terms of their look and function. Moreover, the genes that control sex in humans and rodents are absent in the platypus. This observation suggests that the platypus will be particularly useful for understanding early mammal evolution. We mainstream mammals share a lot in common with all other forms of life, and genetic insights from the platypus helps us make sense about what makes mammals different from other groups. The more we learn about the platypus genome, the more we know about ourselves. Oh, my God.